Rob Vanwalker, that's right, and research focuses on the experimental methods of the investigation of individual and group behavior. Uh, among many other things, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, introduced Lynn to a lot of experimental design principles and economics, or helped introduce perhaps. We can get more into that. Very accomplished, of course, uh, author, and uh, won numerous awards over the years, uh, too many to list here. And, uh, you know, last, and of course, Jimmy and Mike, as you guys, I think, know, we're also co-directors of the workshop on and off between uh, 1999 and 2011. And then last, but certainly not least, Bill Blumquist of Wow Fame. Wow, Bill. Uh, which was our workshop on the workshop, which was just lovely this last summer. Um, professor, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, you can, please, 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 as well, Barb. That'd be great. Uh, professor, you know, Blumquist, of course, Professor of Political Science, um, at the IUPUI, director of the Liberal Arts uh, Management Program up there, director of Individualized Major Program, adjunct professor at SPIA, um, and a PhD here at IU, and, you know, I bet you're looking forward to a few golf courses in your own right, Bill, at some point in time. So, how about one more round of applause for all of them, and Barb, thank you so much for coming as well. This is great. We, we have just a few uh, questions to get us going here, but really quickly, we're going to turn it over to self-organize this process from the bottom up. So think of questions that you'd like to ask this distinguished panel, perhaps coming from the clip um, or otherwise. I do want to just mention as well, you know, this will be a fun conversation. We'll have the reception following, but we also have a podcast that's going to be dropping, as the kids say, uh, later this week that's going to feature a long conversation with Jimmy and Mike about some of this stuff. So look for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so just to get the ball rolling, um, everybody, I thought maybe you could reflect just briefly on, you know, when and uh, what were the circumstances in which you first met Lynn, and how did she initially in those early stages affect your, your research? Because I'm sure you came in maybe with a pretty different agenda, right? So perhaps we could just go down the line. And if you'd like to start out, Barbara, sure, that'd be great. This by telling us <laughs> she was 19. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> oh, so that was, what, 20 years ago? One quick story that I remember when I first met them, and I met them uh, because Barbara Gordon, who was married to Scott Gordon, also an economist, I uh, was working in her lab uh, in biology, and she said, what are you going to do? Um, I had just graduated, and she said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. She said, I want you to meet somebody, and she took me over to what was going to become the workshop. And I said, this is Lynn Ostrom, and that's Vincent Ostrom, and there were boxes everywhere, and I had to sit on a box, and immediately they started handing me papers. Here's this paper, and this one is on the mom. And I thought, okay, the mom, this is a strange place, the model of man. And I said, what do you mean the model of man? And Lynn said, it's okay, it's okay, we call it mom. <laughs> um, luckiest person in the history of academia. I had no idea who Eleanor Ostrom or Vincent Ostrom were. I came here to do a PhD in political science. Uh, I got offered a research assistant gig. They assigned me to Eleanor Ostrom, who was, I showed up on the doorstep of her office. She was just starting a term as chair of the political science department. So she was also, there were boxes in her office too, except her office, she was moving into her office as department chair in Woodburn Hall uh, at the time. And I literally showed up on her doorstep and said, hi, I'm your new RA. And uh, that began a 30 year long uh, collaboration. So yeah, wow, pretty lucky. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna take this in a different direction. I'm not gonna follow rules, so. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So what's missing here, and it's yeah. too bad that Barb wasn't filming that night, but I want to give you a little bit of a, <laughs> just a slice of think of Lynn in a different way. And this was, uh, I think, after WOW 3, maybe? Maybe WOW 3? We just had WOW we said six, 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 so a few years ago, 15 years ago. About four. But, um, you know, we were all younger, and Lynn often talked about how much she liked music, in particular, how much she liked the tambourine. And there were several people in the workshop that um, played guitar. One person was a, a master violinist. And if any of you know what a hootenanny is, no. and if some of you do and some of you don't. But anyway, we had a party. We had a party at the end of the while, and there might have been a few beers that were. Might have had a, <laughs> might have had a beer. 
but it turned into one of the best off campus previous. <laughs> <laughs> it was off it was off campus somewhere on the park. <laughs> but what a wonderful night. And we were singing and there was Lynn. I mean we were singing, there were people dancing, Barb. There there were people getting up to the microphone from um I think it's when I started playing La Bamba. We got a whole new group in there, and what a wonderful night. But then there's, so before this, um, at the Tiffany, I went and bought a tambourine. So I handed that to Len during this, after a few years. <laughs> and there's Len, bang, bang, playing that tambourine. Uh, the only problem was it wasn't in beat with the music at all. <laughs> but you know what, she had a wonderful time. So, um, so I met Len, um, <coughs> Actually, watching this film, I realized, in some sense, I met Lynn and Vincent probably in one of the around 19, probably around 1975. Because when I was teaching microeconomics, I would use that little matrix that was up there. I just didn't know I'd met Lynn and Vincent at that time. And I still use it when I teach that class. But um, I came to IU in 1984. <coughs> I had been doing experiments on public goods which is closely related to these free rider problems that go along with collective choice and link naturally up to common human resources. Uh, so I was doing public good experiments. And Lynn, so this is Lynn though. Lynn, uh, not only was she multidisciplinary, but she was multiple methods. And I think the trip to Bielefeld, where she got to know the Reinhardt uh, Zelton and the group there that were doing game theory and experimental economics. And Lynn just thought, this is whole another way for me to take my research and our research, I should say, the research of the people around her. Um, so I found my way to the workshop, but I didn't know Lynn well. And one weekend, uh, she called me and said, Jimmy, you want to have Roy Gardner and I write an NSF proposal? So that was that was the start of our first experiments on common pool resources. Um, and it's amazing how many, how much that research has influenced future researchers in particular, I think in terms of experimental <coughs> economics, much of which moving out of our lab, which we have a lab over in Woodburn Hall because of Lynn, because Lynn was the entrepreneur. I mean, and I mean that in only very positive ways. She was an entrepreneur. So uh, we have a lab that we have people come in and they can collect the action decisions, but much more of that has also moved to the field where they're going into, in many cases, developing countries and sitting down with uh, villagers in those cases in many places and talking with them about decisions and putting them in these decision environments, helping them to understand the ramifications of different types of rule structures and free rider issues and free rider problems and things like that. So that started, um, uh, started a very long collaboration that went um, up to the Nobel. So. <clears throat> Thanks, Jimmy. That who nanny story is always tough to top. But uh, <laughs> um, I, I take issue with with Bill's claim that he's the luckiest foot scientist. I think, I think I might have been. Uh, I came here looking for a job. Okay, uh, interviewing for a job and got hired here and um, uh, didn't know anything about Lynn and Vincent when I got hired. Although I remember Lynn is the one who asked me the question and couldn't answer during my job talk. Uh, 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 Vincent, I don't remember right away, but. Later on, it was Vincent that really caught my attention because I had been trained to study international conflict where the basic unit of analysis was nation states who were interacting with each other or rivals, our rivals. In particular, is what I'd done my dissertation on. And Vincent would keep saying, there's no such thing as a state. You know, the state, the concept we have of a unitary state, you know, that's, that's imaginary. The, the, you use the word state, you're just, or the word government, you're 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 just you're you're playing word games. There, there's no there there. The, the, the governments are these multiplex, complicated kinds of things. They were studying local governments, and at that level, there certainly was complexity. And at the international level, there was some complexity. And so, you know, he's basically undermining the entire basis of the, the my career and how I got this job and I was still trying to get tenure at the time, you know, and so I kind of ignored him for a while. Uh, but a minute it sunk through and I really started looking at international relations in a very different way uh, and seeing things that I hadn't seen before because 
uh, it hadn't been emphasized in our in our textbooks. And having and going to the uh, the workshop um, uh, weekly presentations, cloakroom presentations on Mondays, just seeing people doing all kinds of stuff on all kinds of topics on all kinds of different disciplines, and really got interested in policy questions more generally. Uh, and so somehow I moved from studying uh, the superpower arms race to now studying U.S. health policy, and you know, uh, and uh, it sort of makes sense looking back on it uh, because of the interactions of Vincent. Vincent in particular. Uh, and then with, with Lynn, I got more of a sense of how one might do research. Vincent was really good at posing these very difficult problems and these questions that no one could sort of answer. Uh, 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 we certainly couldn't repeat the question because it was just, anyway. Vincent was, uh, you, you've given a nice portrayal of him in his, in his more clear <laughs> moments. Uh, 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 a little less obscure than sometimes he used to talk to me always about the Holy Roman Empire, uh, um, Cheyenne way, the way they stopped, solved disputes, and, uh, and this was helping me understand international relations. And it did, it did, that's a weird thing. But from then I really learned how to understand policy, the complexities of policy, and to get your handles around, your minds around it, to understand it. Uh, and I also learned a lot from Lynn about how to be an administrator uh, and um, uh, her ability to get resources from uh, um, uh, campus administrators was really, really a sight to see. <laughs> uh, uh, it was, you know, anything anyone was playing was trying to pull on me. It's like, okay, I've seen that before. Uh, <laughs> you know, you should do it this way. You know, Lynn was a little nicer than she would build up this big ass. Uh, but it just was um, uh, a great joy to work with Lynn and Vincent um, all those years. And I really feel lucky. So, got it. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to reflect on in that in that clip, um, and including David. You should really grow your hair out again, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe someday. Maybe someday. Someday. Maybe next while. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, one thing that really way. strikes me in looking at that is, I mean, they, these are these are very brave people. You know, very brave people that were doing you know pioneering multidisciplinary research before that was. Yeah not something you really did um, as, as we heard even today or even in political science alone this really you know broke some new ground to say nothing of collaborating with social scientists and other types of scientists natural sciences across the university and i'm wondering what what do you or how do you um, think about um, the degree to which they inspired so many young scholars to follow in their footsteps because you know they were training people to also challenge the conventional wisdom um, it was hard for them to do it. It was hard, of course, for all of you, I'm sure, to do it in the same way. So, you know, what was it about it? Was it the compelling way they asked questions? Was it the questions themselves? Was it their personalities or, you know, some combination of all the above that really led to, you know, this community, basically? Do you have any reflections on that? And then we will open it up, okay? So do think of other questions you'd like to ask. Um, a couple of thoughts on this. When I was interviewing Vincent one time, um, I asked him some questions about the Snake River, which was one of the studies that he did in the uh, early 1950s. And that situation was going to lead, lead to some damming that probably would destroy the sp spawning of um, the salmon. And I asked him about the, the political uh, aspects of that, meaning what was it like to deal with a governor that didn't want certain things and a water board that didn't want, he was the vice uh, chair of the water board. And he said, the only way to bring anything to light is to do a study. And so all you need to do is try to get the study done, mm -hmm. try to get people with momentum on the study and more or less, you can have multiple purposes for this study, but the only way to bring whatever problem it is to light is to do some kind of work where you really are investigating things. And in order to do that investigation, um, the, the documents are, exist um, at the workshop or at the early library probably now. In order to do that study, he knew to ask people all up and down the Snake River what was their own experience with this. And 
I asked him things, he was much, much older when people started to talk about climate change, but I also asked him some questions um, in that context. And <coughs> what he was suggesting is that people who want to make a policy change need to go out and ask regular people what they see in the way of change, because when they begin to reflect on the changes that are happening, called climate change, they will understand more about the science, that there is such a thing called science of climate change. So those are just a couple of thoughts on that. That's great. Yeah, along a similar line, the emphasis that they shared with all of their colleagues, including their students, um, that I think resonated with me came down to this, and they would never have said it this tritely, but um, the, you know, academics have disciplinary boundaries, but problems don't. Mm -hmm. and, and if you really want to try to figure out a problem, you have to do this, as, as Barb said, you have to, to start looking at that. And, um, and my introduction to that, which uh, gave me a career, for which I'm ever grateful, is, um, <laughs> And they wanted me to look at groundwater basins in Southern California. And I'm a Midwest kid with a political <laughs> science degree in, in, at Indiana University. I'm like, water? I'm like, what, is there a problem? Like, <laughs> <laughs> 40 inches of this stuff falls out of the sky for free on an average year. When you, when you, when you, you know, the biggest problem is where to put it all. What are you about? But my point of this story is that I had to figure out, not just in order to, to help Lynn with her research, but that then eventually became my own, um, I had to figure out how the groundwater basin works. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't, I mean, I could understand at a certain level, but a pretty superficial, doesn't last very long level. Why these well owners were in competition with one another and why there was long-term degradation and depletion effects and why it was hard to get past that and what it was that they were trying to deal with. And, and the, the underlying message of all that is not that everybody should study groundwater, California groundwater, although certainly you should. <laughs> um, I, I don't understand why you don't. Uh, but, uh, um, but, but, but that idea that problems don't have disciplinary boundaries and I had to learn a little bit of geology and a little bit of engineering and a little bit of lots of stuff in order to understand what that is. Um, what I have thought, many of the colleagues at the workshop and certainly Lynn and Vincent, um, most people had something else that they were really capable of doing. Mm -hmm in addition to research, being a scholar, or being a political scientist or an economist, certainly. Um, so it wasn't merely that they went beyond disciplinary boundaries, but I think that they understood scholarship as something in the world and moving beyond the boundaries of even higher education. And most colleagues at the workshop similarly had other things that they were able to do and could have turned to those things if they didn't maintain a job in the social sciences at a university. Really? <laughs> 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 well, you're bad you guitar skills. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> your woodworking skills. We really should have brought a tiny guitar. There were a lot of things you, you did also. And the <laughs> um, look, my thoughts on this kind of, they certainly build off of that. Um, so my personal view is research is boring if it's not a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this joy of working together, and, and partly it is bringing different skills, but there's just the product that comes out of working together is just a better product. product. And I think these days you see much more collaboration across all disciplines than you did 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And part of it's because the disciplines have evolved, but part of it, I think, is people found that it's um, it's a more much more productive process. So if you if you go back and you think about the life around the, the workshop, it was one big collaboration, and that collaboration included starting with the staff and Lynn and Vincent. And, and I mean, Vincent is a wonderful person. I know Lynn 
Lynn gained so much from her contestation with Vincent. But Lynn is the collaborator. She is the, she's the glue that brings so much of this together. And I'm going to come back to her entrepreneurial ability. Um, so I think in the end, they create this environment within the workshop. And then this goes back to, and I think it starts with this being looked at our trip, where they start bringing this idea of bringing in more visiting scholars, postdocs, et cetera, from around the world. And it doesn't just happen. You don't just don't bring people in and it happens. Mm -hmm. But they had this gift of being able to make people more productive. So then these people are there. They become more productive. And, and you, I mean, one of my, my ongoing collaborations was with a postdoc that came to the workshop 15, 20 years ago. And so, so what happens then is you start having this network. And these networks develop and they develop and their students develop. And so that's why you see this. If, if somehow you could have this look at this broad network of people involved in the workshop over 30, 40 years and how it's extending now, it would be immense. And so I, so I think, at least in my mind, it was this collaboration. And I'll just end on one of the vivid memories I have is early days of working with Dan and Roy Gardner. Roy is one of the smartest people I've ever known. With an unusual was, but unfortunately he passed away. Um, Lynn and I had to talk him into getting off his typewriter to using a computer, and I, and I found out later the reason he didn't need a computer, he didn't need, he already knew all these things. But he, I mean, he didn't, he didn't need the internet. He knew these things, but it was this collaboration. It was this, it was this collaboration that we'd be sitting there and working on drafting documents, and it would be a back and forth, and it, it, that's. That's the fun part of this. It makes it much more exciting. Interesting. Yes, let me say a few words about this. I've had a chance to see Lynn uh, in particular interact with a lot of students and Vincent interact with a lot of international um, visiting scholars who have come in. And both of them really had great listening skill. They would listen to what problems, like I came in with trying to understand how states interact and stuff like that. And Vincent kept probing and probing. <laughs> and, and they were, they would ask questions that would help the student or the visiting scholar or the colleague to um, do a better job at answering the questions they were pursuing. So it wasn't that they were trying to get them to, you know, they weren't asking leading questions that you had to do it this way or I'd do it this way. A lot of academics questions are sort of like that. But it was more, okay, this is what you want to know. Well, this is what you have to know. I've seen lots of students going into their um, uh, their progress review meeting and, and wants to study something like water and then say, well, you have to have this course in hydrology. And they go, no, I don't need to. I say, yes, you need to take this course in hydrology. I mean, and it would, you know, it'd be chemistry the next time or it'd be environmental toxins or something. Every, you know, every damn one that was doing the policy then had to learn about that policy. It, it, you know, it got to be a game where it's going to come from next time. Uh, and, uh, but they did need it for to be able to do the work. Uh, and Vincent just had this way of listening to, um, of asking a series of questions to really get it to help the visiting scholars see their own political system in a different light. And just kind of take it apart and put it together in a different, different piece. But they, they were helping students and collaborators understand the questions they were trying to solve and and understand what they would need to know or who they would need to talk to to figure that out so i think they imparted that up to a lot of their colleagues and a lot of their students and it's those listening skills that that are really i think were really key to their uh, their success and not being afraid to try new things try to learn new things mm -hmm. um, and maybe the current visiting scholars would you guys mind raising your hands so you know so everybody during the networking reception to follow seek them out yes no welcome that's great right. this is great we'll have a great talk on water governance right so come to the research here um, so uh, I have plenty more but I want to hear we all want to hear from you guys right so if you have a question please feel free I can keep going if not. okay please great I'm Stefan, I'm a visiting scholar living in Germany. I'm a very simple economist specializing in history, economic thought, and I have a question to Dr. Walker specifically. I mean, Bill and I talked on the way back from the ceremony, and I wanted to put a question to you since he suggested I could. Thank you. Um, so, as I said, I'm an economist, and I would be curious how economists at IU or elsewhere 
reacted to her as a political scientist getting the Nobel. She so what kind of PhD, right? Forget it. <laughs> so what kind of what kind of curious or less curious reactions did you get? That's a tough question. If you think about um, the disciplines within the social sciences, if you think about how broad economics is, I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands. Mm. Of so I'm almost sure there are economists who had no idea who Lynn was, mm -hmm. and certainly didn't know the work that she had done, and certainly had not read Governing the Commons. So I'm not going to quite answer your question because I really don't know the answer. I know, I know in the world of experimental economics, it wasn't even a surprise. The, I, I mean, there are senior economist, experimental economists that tell me at some point Lynn's going to get the Nobel Prize. So, so I suspect you'd have to go into this. Lynn was, um, they're great friends with Doug North, another Nobel. So there's this group of economists <coughs> within probably political economy, Lynn, I call it. That probably weren't surprised at all. And so in that sense, um, it, it's just, it's, that's, that's, it's very likely that's true for almost all Nobel Prize winners, especially mm -hmm. if you go to a discipline as large as economics or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, I can tell you this, that um, I, and I can think of one specific example, actually, the people that, met Lynn and Vincent, and I'll, I'll speak spe more specifically to Lynn because that's the connection I had to people who met Lynn, were just incredibly impressed. Um, how well read and thoughtful, and I have one particular person that comes to mind, it's a Caltech professor who met Lynn on a train, and I ran into him later and he said, you know, Jimmy, we ended up sitting together talking for hours. He said, it's just incredible all the things she knows about, the breadth of her understanding. So. Um, so maybe it doesn't really matter how that 95% of economists <laughs> uh, uh and, and I'm pretty sure there's, there's definitely so some jealousy probably and some misunderstandings. But certainly the people that know of this type of work um, would be very, very pleased to see it and expect it in some sense. I think just while we're on the topic, how about maybe one quick recollection for what was the first thing you thought or did when you heard that Lynn had won the Nobel 10 years ago in a few days? First thing I heard is when I heard it, I was sitting there watching the Weather Channel, right. and 10 minutes later, I was sitting at their house. There you go. So, uh, <laughs> now, the <laughs> you're going on, going see if I could help. <laughs> That's right. in, in, in my case, uh, uh, I um, received a call from the president's office, President Robbie's office. Because they were trying to find Lynn, because Lynn by this time had stopped answering her phone. Well done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and it, yeah, again, I was co-director of the workshop with Jimmy at the time, and I said, I don't know, maybe she's out of the country. I can't keep dragging her. <laughs> that wasn't the right answer. <laughs> so I went in, and, and boy, phones were just ringing, ringing all that fucking stuff. It was the staff were really struggling to take care of all that, uh, and it was just it was just incredible. But that, yeah, that's that's the first I learned of it was that. I better get back my ass in there. <laughs> oh, wow. A funny story that relates to this. Yeah. Um, um, so, although we joked that Lynn worked 16, 18 hours a day, and we knew she'd get up and work in the middle of the night, but my understanding is when it, the Nobel the people called her, she was actually asleep. Yeah. She was going, oh, wow, this is really strange. But she'd already been up working that night right. and gone back to bed. So um, it was, she wasn't asleep, she was she napping. Was. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Adam Smith quote as well. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a recollection? Oh, it's okay. Um, well, I have a, I still have the voicemail message on my oh. phone from her oh, um, that says, and, and it's just so funny. Hello, Barb. This is Lynn. <laughs> Um, I won a prize. I'm wondering if you'd like to go to Stockholm. Now, they won't pay for you. They will only pay for Vincent and me. So, but we will get a discount at the hotel. Um, other, other questions? Yeah, please. please. Um, I don't know if this is a relevant question, but I've got to ask it anyway. Um, if Lynn were here today, given the great divide politically over 
climate change, those that believe that it's occurring, those that do not. Do you think her work would have shifted at all? Do you think she'd be in, um, involved in the conversation at a different level? I'm just curious how you think she would have thought about this political climate and as it relates to climate change and what she may have said or done to shift her research. I, yeah. And if I may, I mean, some of her work was about building trust generally. Maybe you could right. reflect on that. And, and also, there was a more general question that I wanted to bring up about unfinished work that, you know, Lynn and Vincent both had. So, you know, if uh, she was still alive, you know, 10 years now, what, what do you think would have been some of the contributions? What was left undone? And maybe, especially the climate change. Let me, let me yeah. talk about the, the climate thing because yeah. um, um, I really liked the work that Lynn was doing on that and trying to you know, around 2009 and 10 is when she first started really getting into climate change research. Most of her work had been at sort of a local level. Mm -hmm. She was getting more involved in the global network. We kind of worked at Eduardo Grandizio, a big, big, big participant in these days, uh, anthropologist who's very deeply involved in the workshop. Um, and she was basically arguing that back then it was all about international treaties and, and negotiations and that. And she said, you know, that's fine. But what's really going to make a difference is if, if individual customers and corporations and local communities uh, and groups sort of change their behavior and, and that that hadn't really been part of the conversation. Uh, and to look at it more as a practical problem and not as a liberal conservative sort of debate. Uh, and I think that if she were around now, that would be really a, a theme she would emphasize even more. Mm -hmm. I still remember one time she came down after she had interviews like crazy after the prize. Uh, and one day she'd have a long interview with one reporter who was very concerned that she was so anti-market. Why are you so opposed to the market? Why do you think government should do everything? And then she had back to back. The next interview was from someone from the other side of the <laughs> spectrum. I said, why are you always so opposed to the state? You know, you know, we need to sort of be doing this. And she basically gave the same answer to both both of the both right. of the interviewers. Right. You know, basically that's only part of the story. I mean, the, the states and markets are only part of the institutional diversity we need to know about, and we need to take advantage of different ways of doing things. Commons management, common pool property management was was one of the uh, options that hadn't even been considered very much. And that was one of the things that really was highlighted by the Nobel Committee. Here's something that's always been around, but the disciplines didn't see very well, or Eric Harden convinced everyone that they couldn't exist. Uh, you know, and and I think she would, they would both be very frustrated at the infantile tone of political discourse mm. in this country now. It's really gotten to that level where they're not talking about anything real. Uh, for them, politics should, was all about problem solving and dealing with the issues as they really are and finding solutions and not debating points on different parts. So I think, I, I think it'd be a really tough time for them because the way they would like to see politics done is like forgotten now. And it's, it's really bad. Yeah. For a little while uh, in, I think it was the 2000s, although I might be remembering wrong, Lynn was president of the American Political Science Association, and one of the things that she tried to do, because it's only a brief stint as president, uh, is to reintroduce um, civic education as a core concern, because it's easy for academic political science to I would say not our job, you know, and and and, and <coughs> I think in large measure, mm -hmm. and um, and then of course she, you know, she participated in, in panels and discussions and, and, and papers around that at the time, and then necessarily was pulled off onto other things, and then two thousand nine, you know, everything goes crazy uh, uh, with the Nobel and the years thereafter. I think. So I'm using this as a bridge, but not only from your question, but also to the unfinished business question, because I, I can't help but think that in addition to the way she did respond to the climate question when it was presented, 
which was look at all of the things that we can do without worrying about global scale, trying to construct global scale institutions and international protocols and all that stuff, but there's a heck of a lot that can be done successfully at other scales, more human scales to try to be effective. Um, I think it might have also, the current, you asked not only about the climate change question, but the current politics as Mike was reflecting. I think it might have, wanted, might have led her to want to go back and pick up that other issue that she kind of had to set aside for a little while under the demands of other things. How do we relearn um, democratic which was a core concern of Vincent's um, as well? I was going to comment a little bit more on um, Vincent's place in some of this. Um, my colleagues are absolutely right, I think, about uh, Lynn's approach to climate change and asking uh, people to think about polycentric decision making and how the kind of institutional arrangements that support that. And I had the uh, good fortune of working with Vincent in 2008 on a new edition of his political theory of a compound republic. And in the revised chapter, <coughs> that we did um, more or less on what turns out to be presidential government. Um, he had written up through the Watergate period. And so the work, he, he saw this, the rolling back of an imperial presidency that happened right after Watergate as being the enormously important thing that had happened that had brought us back to a compound republic and federalism and polycentricity. And by the time we were writing again, we uh, the imperial presidency was being reconstituted. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, people like John Yu writing that the president could uh, circumvent various kinds of conventions and so forth. And I, Vincent was really, really beside himself that uh, it had come back. And, and yet, one of the things that he said is one, don't ever be thinking about solutions to problems. The idea is to move to the next phase of getting closer to something that is workable. And then the time period changes and the context changes and people will continue to try to game a system or however you want to put it. And so those problems will come back in a new form. So you just have to keep working on it. And I, I do think he, I think they would both be very perplexed and uh, not at all sanguine about the situation currently. Um, but I also think that it wouldn't shock him completely. And he would be thinking a lot about what is it that citizens do. You know, I was a part of a group not too long ago where people were talking about something with needed to have more do it yourself things in the United States, to, which I thought. You know, the whole rest of the world is do it yourself. I mean, in a lot of places, people know how to do it themselves. So I guess I thought about Vincent then and thought there should be some DIY, DIY for government. Do it yourself. Mm -hmm. like, do some policy maker boot camp at the yeah, workshop. Policy maker. Great. Other questions? Please, are early. I'd like to uh, ask you to think about the label Bloomington School. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Mitchell wrote that article in 1988 that put it on the map along with the Virginia School and the Rochester School. So in Europe, uh, uh, and then the label has, has spread around the world. So what should we do here in Bloomington to promote the Bloomington School label? And what is the value of that label, if there is any? Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's one thing we discussed at the affiliate meeting. Last yeah. Uh, co-edited four volumes at Lincoln School in the title, so I probably ought to answer this. Um, yeah, I'm of two minds on that. I mean, I think the Bloomington School was, was a very nice statement that what Lynn and Vincent were doing was significantly different than the public choice folks who were really focusing on rent seeking and gaming the system as that's all politics really is. Because Lynn and Vincent took politics seriously. It wasn't just about material sort of conflict more about social choice theory, which was the Rochester School, which was all about gaming the system, literally. I mean, it was about game theory, things like that. 
uh, and both of those were much more mathematical than what the Bloomington School was. So the Bloomington School to me is really the way Lynn and Vincent were trying to understand political systems and the polycentric initially comes up in, in Barb's film a couple of times uh, and the, the institutional complexity that Lynn always sort of emphasized. But the other, the other sort of reaction to that is that, you know, Lynn and Vincent aren't here anymore. Uh, and, and so we don't have that same uh, driving force to continue to inspire. We have their work, but we don't really have the driving force of their personalities. But there are so many people out there working in other places <laughs> that have had, um, that have been influenced by Lynn and Vincent, or who's, who their own mentors were mentored by Lynn and Vincent. She used to talk about her grandchildren, uh, a student of a student, uh, and, and some of those have really been going. And uh, they're out there. We just had this workshop, the sixth workshop on the workshop last June, and there were 250 or so people from, I don't know how many countries, but definitely all, I think every continent except Antarctica is what was in the newsletter. Uh, we should uh, fix that for a while. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> fix that. Yeah, uh, but um, the Bloomington School is out there. It's just okay. not Bloomington-centric anymore. And the one advantage of Bloomington School is it sounds better than Ostromian. Uh, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to say Ostromian approach yeah. or the Ostromian approach. The Bloomington schools, are, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's, there is, I think, a real mentality that is different that Lynn and Vincent brought to the way they study politics. That is just a unique combination of, as you know, several different political tradition, political philosophy traditions and empirical work in that. Uh, uh, but whether that's something we should seriously try to connect to Bloomington and make a big sales pitch on that, you know, and, and, and identify ourselves in that. Um, the Ostrom's name has to be in there some way, really more than the Bloomington. But on the other hand, they could not have done that everywhere. Uh, Indiana University really does have a long tradition of letting lots of very unusual, innovative research departments or teaching yeah. departments like the get together yeah. like the Kinsey and all kinds of things. It's really remarkable. <laughs> and, and we still get people coming in from other universities come in and say, boy, you, it seems like it's easy to do interdisciplinary research here. We just we can't we can't connect the people back on their campus. They wonder how we're able to do it. But it's been a long tradition. Yeah. They just found the right place to sort of be able to do something like that. So I know I don't know that's that's kind of it's you know, yeah. anyone Just, else want to? Yeah, very brief. A couple of yeah, comments. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've never used that term, Bloomington School, at least not on a regular <coughs> basis. To me, it, it, what is here is, is this approach to doing research and the, how you've seen that research evolve over the years, uh, going in this direction, going in this direction, going in this direction, but also there, is a, there, are, tying, there are ties to all of this research. Um, but yeah, I guess my main point would be uh, what I think is still going on out there is this collaborative approach to doing research. And that's what I think that's at least the, the part of the Ostrom workshop that I saw, that was what was so unique and wonderful about it. Mm. Whether we call it a Bloomington School approach or an Ostrom workshop approach or whatever, um, I kind of like the Ostrom workshop approach better than calling it the Bloomington School. It might be at Bloomington School of Biology or Bloomington School of Physics, I don't know. Um, I, I think we gain more by looking at how how they did research and how they did how they collaborated together mm -hmm. and use that as um, as a way of thinking about our own future research going forward. And I totally agree with Mike, uh, and this is kind of what I was saying earlier. It's I think the the scope of what they created began, we should yeah. say, is, is immense. And it's going through, most of it probably is now, related to the work on the commons and climate change, those sorts of things, which are closely related. Most of it is. Uh, and that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that it's, uh, it can be dangerous to do um, an intellectual history that ends up as a brand. Um, because I, I do think there are principles involved. And in the 
days when they were here, Vincent would have talked about his principles as having a macro level approach. But for anybody who was looking at this, it wasn't macroeconomics, certainly. It was political philosophy. And it's a particular angle on political philosophy. And that, I think, was very important and at the baseline. So Tocquevillian analytics and thinking about Hobbes and those sorts of points. Um, those were a set of principles. And then I do think that there are many design principles, and but deeper concepts than even the design principles that Lynn would have been talking about. Bob Warren said that he thought that the Lakewood project was a precursor of the of the Oster workshop. And so I think that it isn't so much on the one hand place specific, but it did take place here. And it is, I think, extremely important to, to uh, sort of distinguish what they did much more than it wasn't just public choice of the Rochester School or public choice of the Virginia School. What they, so to think of the Bloomington School as one of three movements in public choice or away from public choice, I think is far too narrow. To think of it as only or, or even primarily about economics as it is understood in the United States is probably too narrow. It's a much broader set of principles and I, I think that it's worth thinking about a workshop principle, but you know, Vincent had, they both, they called a meeting in which part of the meeting was to ask the question, is there something called workshop analytics? And is it different from Tocquevillian analytics as understood at the workshop? And in what ways? So they used the words workshop analytics. And just to briefly build off that, you know, one thing we're doing at the workshop now is to, one, give voice to people still doing this work all over the world, right? There's a lot of ways we do that, um, including the new podcast, so take part in that. Uh, but also for teachers, right? So a lot of this, as, as, as Mike mentioned, I mean, four edited volumes is wonderful, could be treat, but we're also trying to make it a little more accessible these days, right? So we're going to be standing up a new web page for professors, for teachers, right? To make the core concepts more accessible with definitions for, you know, Bloomington School, IAB, SES frameworks, the governing knowledge comments stuff, social <laughs> design principles, maybe even some recorded webinars that I'm sure will be featuring some of the people on the panel, and probably some of you as well, um, just to spread, spread the wisdom a little bit, right? Because we get approached by this all the time. Delegation from Ukraine just last week wanted to do an Ostrom class for their university, right? So we want to make this portable, get those ideas out there, make them accessible as we can. Was the conversation recorded? Do we have a transcript? <laughs> um, other questions. We have about uh, 10 minutes left, so we'll do a couple more than maybe a lightning round to finish this up. Yeah. Thanks. My name is Fadi. I'm a graduate student. My question is given the centrality of political philosophy in Ostrom's work, uh, what, what are your reflections on the current state of graduate student training with regards to political philosophy? and do you think that uh, graduate students should spend uh, more time with some of these great works to build um, empirical research as well? So thank you. Did you keep me wise six, seven, three, Bill? I don't know. You want to yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, I think this, these, there's a couple of things that go together here. Uh, one is the importance of, of knowing uh, and having some exposure to uh, political philosophy and, and great um, sort of works in, in political philosophy. But um, I, I think that one of the things that attracted Vincent and Lynn to Tocqueville is that Tocqueville both scratched their itch for um, understanding how democratic governance could look and could work, but it also scratched their itch for doing that from the viewpoint of the citizen. And they were able to sustain, Vincent in particular, a lifelong relationship 
with Tocqueville and democracy in America, really has, has made lots of contributions to that work as well. And I think it goes, it, it connects back to some of the stuff that we started with. There's, there's a puzzle to be solved, right? There's a, there's a, there's a, how do you, if you're going to have a self-governing republic where the government doesn't do everything, but government is still an important thing to have, that's the space in which you're living. <laughs> then it's only going to be successful and sustainable if you also have a citizenry you can make it work. And the challenge of democratic governance and democratic life is where do you get those people <coughs> from? How are, how are democratic citizens brought into existence and, 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 and kept going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then it becomes a problem and they loved problems. <laughs> it becomes a puzzle and they loved puzzles. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a problem that doesn't have disciplinary boundaries. There are philosophical foundations to it. There are also practical things to it, like, you know, how to, you know, you know mm -hmm. is it part of, you know, the minimum pain threshold that you have to uh, inflict on undergraduates and give, give them three credit hours for a course, you know, what are the 19 principal offices of the New England Township? You know, I mean, but, but I mean, it's, 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 you know, beyond that, I mean, it's, 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 it's both detailed on the ground, how do people learn how to do this, as well as really macro considerations about what are all of the challenges in making that happen and what are all the benefits that, that flow from it. And I, I think that's why there was kind of a lifelong love, love affair with Tocqueville that went beyond any other political philosopher for them. But, but Mark, you know this stuff better than I would think. I also want you to reflect on one other thing, if you wouldn't mind, Mark, since time's kind of short. We'd be remiss if we didn't cover it. As you saw, you know, Lynn was a pathbreaker in a lot of ways, and a woman at a time in academia where, my gosh, that was easier said than done to say, nothing of doing multidisciplinary work. So I'm wondering, you know, maybe you could reflect a little bit on how you think she would feel that she's, you know, still the only woman who's won the Nobel Prize oh, in economics now 10 years later. And, and as we celebrate next year, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, the unveiling of Lynn's statue, I think it's a time to kind of reflect to see what we can all do to help advance and make that uh, make that happen. Okay, first uh, philosophy question. Um, I think it's really critical. Uh, one thought I have is that Vincent was a political philosopher mm -hmm. and that Vincent pulled together uh, in novel ways. Vincent doesn't read Tocqueville like anyone else does and he didn't read Hobbes as anyone else did. Mm -hmm. He didn't read the Federalists like Martin Diamond does or anybody that studies that work. And so one part of this which I think goes to what Bill is saying is when you read Vincent, you read a sort of compilation of his take on what was important about these writers mm -hmm. and these thinkers and these doers in the case of like Madison, Hamilton and so forth. Um, and I think you do get, you don't get this uh, a political philosophy view exactly of say Tocqueville. You get Vincent's understanding of the aspects of citizenship, the aspects of training people to be democratic, the aspects of association. It's not not Tocqueville, but <laughs> Tocqueville was much more than that. And Vincent is creating something from this. And I, I think that act of creativity is what's very, very interesting mm -hmm. in terms of reading him. Mm -hmm. um, on the woman question. <sighs> You guys know. I know. And I was, like, I was just, gonna, I was just turning to the man to find out if they had something to say. Okay, exactly. Perfect. I just wanted to make sure. Um, um, I think, on one hand, um, Lynn did not like being identified as the woman who won the prize and so forth. Um, I think that she, like, yes, like many, would want to be seen as the person who won the prize. 
I, I absolutely think that. Um, I also think, though, that she um, was perplexed at much of what went on. And I, I don't know that I would have called her a, a trailing spouse because she had an appointment here and they made it clear that Vincent was not going to come if Lynn didn't have an appointment. Okay, so I feel that I should clear that up a little bit. And they could not stay at UCLA for uh, several reasons, but one is because UCLA had a nepotism law and they could not have had an appointment at UCLA together. And so among the things that they did was try to find a university uh, or college that didn't have that kind of law and Indiana University didn't. They had several offers and Indiana University did make, as we heard earlier today, the right move. Mm -hmm. And Lynn got, an, Lynn got an offer also and that's why they came. I, I don't know if I want to go out uh, on a limb and say she'd be disappointed that there have been no other women who have been selected for a Nobel Prize in economics. I, I think that what might be really perplexing to her is why still in the United States so little is done and understood generally in the public, but generally speaking in academia too, with the commons, with cooperation, with this middle ground, because around the world that really isn't true. And so around the world, much has been going on with the commons and with collective choice and with cooperation as something that is not divorced from competitive economics or economics of a competitive market, but is something that needs to be investigated on its own right. Mm -hmm. And so that, I guess, I think is the mission of the next 10 years. And that's one. Yeah. Um, we're pretty much out of time. So any, any final thought uh, from any of the panelists that they'd like to offer? So, before so we one of the serious and also less serious statement um, Going back to one of the questions earlier, um, you know, the Osterhams did not have a television in their house. So I think maybe what they would be arguing for is everybody take your televisions out. And that might help the solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Well, how about a round of applause for a wonderful panel? <laughs> Uh, this is World Commons Week, if you weren't aware already. So the International Association for the Study of the Commons, which of course Len you know, helped to found, has events going on all over the world all week. So check it out. There's online webinars, all kinds of stuff. Also, Wednesday, we have our Oakshire Memorial Lecture with Doc Searles over at 6 o'clock, right over there, Doc. Uh, and then move forward rooms. So you can say hello as well during the networking reception. Thanks for being here. We have our research series, of course, at noon uh, with Mark which is going to be great, and a lot of other events. So come by the workshop anytime. We'd love to see you. On behalf of this wonderful community, on behalf of our program directors, Angie and Dean and Gustavo, the wonderful staff, thank you all so much again. Our more than 575 affiliates, wow, thank you for being here. And uh, we wanted to end with this uh, dedication from Governing the Commons from Lynn uh, to Vincent for his love and contestation. So thank you all. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And drinks. Who brought a camera? <laughs>